Hi, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number one, Knowledge Representation with Graphs. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about the semantic web. What's the semantic web? It's a web of data. The most easiest definition you will find here in a popular article back then published more than 20 years ago in the Scientific American, which tells the semantic web is an extension of the current web. So it's not something different, something extra. It's simply an extension of the current World Wide Web in which information is given a well-defined meaning. So we have here again the concept of explicit knowledge representation. And the purpose, of course, is better enabling computers and people to work in cooperation. So to ease the burden of programming and of our daily life in dealing with the information that has been provided in the World Wide Web. So that's the vision of the semantic web as stated by Tim Berners-Lee, who also happens to be the inventor of the World Wide Web. And of course, there's lots of technology involved in the semantic web. That's the semantic web technology stack with lots of technologies that you see here. You might feel a little bit overwhelmed, but don't worry. We will go piece by piece through this cube or this architecture, and you will learn in the subsequent lectures lots of the techniques that are used here to represent knowledge and also to make use, to deal with the knowledge, to query the knowledge. So all of that is packed there into the semantic web technology stack that we now uh, at explore piece by piece. Let's start again with the definition. So the semantic web, as we have already seen, is an extension of the traditional web. The meaning of the information, which means the semantics there, is made explicit by formal, structured and standardized knowledge representations. So that will be ontologies. No worries, we will also formally define what an ontology is. Thereby, if we are using explicit knowledge representation, it will be possible to process the meaning of information automatically, as we have seen in the last section of the lecture and to, to, to relate and to integrate heterogeneous data, so data interoperability is easily possible based on semantic web standards. And it will also be possible to deduce implicit, not evident information from existing, from evident information in an automated way. Like for example, you might remember that we have deduced that Sir Alec Guinness it, is not only a person, but since a person is a subclass of creature, Sir Alec Guinness also is a kind of creature. So this kind of deduction of non-evident information, of implicit information, will be made possible. In the end, the semantic web is a kind of global database that contains a universal network of semantic propositions, as we will see. It will become a so-called web of data. Let's start at the very button in our quick tour through the semantic web technology stacks, we are here at the so-called web platform level. The things we are talking about in the semantic web, of course, have to be addressable. They need a unique identifier. And of course, what we are choosing here is we are simply reusing of what exists already on the web, that is the uniform resource identifier, or in its internationalized form, the internationalized resource identifier, URI or IRI. So then Obi-Wan Kenobi, we can simply refer to Obi-Wan Kenobi by giving, let's say, for example, a URI that describes the entity Obi-Wan Kenobi. And you can find this definition here, for example, at DBpedia, at the resource you see here. Going one step further, we also want to, of course, then construct triples or simple statements, as we have seen in the previous lectures. So Obi-Wan Kenobi has an occupation, which is he is a Jedi. We have here subject, predicate and object in the linguistic way of the triple, and this can be explicitly represented with a nice interchange format, which is called RDF, that's the resource description format, which is able then to create triples from these graphs encoded with RDF syntax. So all of our entities we are talking about are represented by URIs. What you see here is the representation of so-called relative or abbreviated URIs. We will talk about that later in detail also. And what we say here simply is Obi-Wan Kenobi has the occupation Jedi. So you see here several 
RDF statements, which form an RDF graphs. You have here Obi-Wan Kenobi is an agent and he has a name, which is Obi-Wan Kenobi in English. His occupation is Jedi. He appears in a series called Star Wars and the portrayal of Obi-Wan Kenobi is Alec Guinness as well as Ian McGregor. So that is simple RDF. We will talk about that then as the main interchange format for the semantic web technology stack. On the next level of the semantic web technology stack, we need the ability to form models and structures out of the classes that we have and out of the relations. We must define classes, we must define relations between classes. And this we can do with languages like, for example, OWL, the web ontology language, RDFS, which is RDF schema, or SCOS, which is a dialect for interrelating here classes and relations with each other. Here, for example, we have a fictional character and the fictional character has a portrayer and the portrayer then always is a person. So we have here two classes and a relation in between. And of course, also a fictional character might be considered being a subclass of an agent. And this, of course, can be represented with RDFS, with it, which is RDF schema. And the interesting thing here is, of course, this is also encoded within the RDF framework, within the RDF interchange format. So you have also have triples here and you simply state that agent here, for example, is a class. And you say that fictional character is a subclass of agent. And you say here that a portrayer is a property and portrayer has a domain which is a fictional character and it has a range which is person. So it connects as a domain which is fictional character with a range that is a person. So this is really, really simple and we will go deeper into that in one of the subsequent lectures to draw exactly and construct these kind of structures. We want to make it, of course, a bit more complicated. So then if you want to define complex classes, you might also there engage then the web ontology language to define ontologies and also to, uh, you, you might deploy uh, logic, so from a logical framework. And there, for example, we could state that Obi-Wan Kenobi has the portrayer Alec Guinness. And of course, Alec Guinness, since he already died a few years ago, he's a member of the class Dead People. And of course, the logical constraint then would be that we define living people and dead people to be disjunctive because nobody can be at the same time alive or dead. Besides, of course, uh, neglecting some, some, some worse movies that you have uh, definitely seen. Okay, and of course, dead people and living people, they are subclass of people. And with a help of rules, then for example, which also belong to logic, what you can do there with logical rules, you can simply state something, a rule that defines what of course are dead people here. You can say, here it's given in terms of uh, first order logic, for all individuals X, there exists an individual Y, that death date of X and Y, when X is a person and Y is a date, if this holds, if there is a death date of person X and date Y, then X belongs to the class of dead people. So this is a logical rule which defines, of course, what are the properties of the people who are dead. And of course, it must be people and they must have a death date in that sense. Okay, so much for this example. We We'll go deeper into this kind of logical rules and how to express that and to use that later on. One of the most important things is as soon as you have constructed a huge knowledge graph, you want to make use of it. And one way to do that is of course to use it with a query language. And the query language we will use here is the Sparkle query language for the semantic web technology stack. Sparkle is based on the query language SQL or SQL that you might already know from relational databases. It's quite similar, but of course, it's a query language that works on graphs. And the main purpose there is also pattern matching on graphs. We will also go in detail or in further details later on on that. So here you see a simple query which determines which of the actors who uh, portrait Obi-Wan Kenobi acted also in other movies. And of course, if you ask something like that, and we have here a link, you can click on the link, you see here then, this is exactly the query engine where you put the link and then you execute the query. And then you see here that the result is Ian McGregor and Alec Guinness. Okay, 
Let's go back into that. And you can also do this, for example, exact the same thing on another um, knowledge base. So first we did this on DBpedia. Here is another example on Wikidata. So again, the same kind of query on another knowledge base. You see here, this looks quite different. And if I do here the same query, you see also here that the results are again Alec Guinness and Ian McGregor. So this is a nice little query language where we can also then, let's say, um, phrase more complicated, more complex questions. For example, if you are asking on which locations did the actors who portrait Obi-Wan Kenobi shoot their movies, you might be able to generate with one of these tools here in Wikidata an entire map denoting the locations where these actors have shot their movies. So for example, you might find out that also here Alec Guinness played Lawrence of Arabia and this of course was, as we see here, filmed partly also in Spain. Quite interesting, isn't it? These are things you can find out then based on the Sparkle query language. And these are the main components now of the Semantic Web Technology Stack. In the next lecture, we will continue with our analysis of the web of data and therefore we will look at especially the notion of linked data within the web of data.